Hello everyone, welcome to today's live video. And today we have a topic that I get questions about all the time and I'm really excited to share with you. So we're gonna talk about phrases that you can use for high risk and sensitive situations. Um, so I have a bunch of notes here I'll be referencing. If you have questions, um, specific situations that you want me to um, address, please feel free to put those in the chat um, or in the comments below. If you have um, phrases that you like to use, replacement things, other suggestions, um, I am just going to give you a little snapshot. Obviously, you might have great ways of phrasing things. So feel free to share with one another and include anything that you have um, in the chat or in the comment section if you're watching the recording. All right. So if you are not familiar with me, I am Dr. Melissa McCaffrey, founder of the free private practice paperwork crash course and owner of QA Prep. And today we are going to talk about how do you document um, sensitive situations and kind of high risk situations. So we're going to talk more more in the lines of sensitivity um, than things like suicidality. Um, but when I mean high risk, things that could potentially, you know, cause harm for your client um, and your records could potentially be involved in um, mitigating that. So, all right, my biggest takeaway. So like the number one thing I want you to take away from this video is that the point of this video and the point of your progress notes is not to hide information about care or about your clients. The, port of, the point of progress notes is to document what has happened. Um, the key there is ensuring that your clients are aware of that fact. So the biggest thing with all of the ethics of what to document and how much detail and what to include and whatnot, the most important thing is client consent. Letting your clients know that you take notes, you document things, you have to, it is legally required of you. Um, at least if you're in the U.S. anywhere, um, it is ethically required of you. So it is something you will be doing and must do. Um, your clients have access to those records and are free to ask you about them at any time. And often, if you are really struggling with this topic, um, actually showing your clients their notes or discussing with them how to write something is a great way to make both of you feel more comfortable with it. So, um, so those are some things that I think like that is absolutely the most important thing to take away from this, because there are times you will have to document things that your clients will not like, um, or that you even will not like, and yet it is the reality of the situation. So that is, um, first and foremost. Okay. Uh, however, I also understand there are some sensitive situations. For example, maybe you are seeing a client who is in an abusive partnership and is also cheating on that partner and is very scared to leave that partner because they're being abused and is worried about being manipulated in some way, is worried that their records could be, you know, um, it potentially released in some kind of a court case or, or requested in some kind of a court case, and they are truly worried about their safety. Right. So that's a scenario that I get questions about. Um, probably the most common scenario I get questions about is discussing things like gender identity or sexuality with teen clients. And especially if they come from um, perhaps a very religious or conservative upbringing and you know that the family is not supportive of that. And yet it's something that the teen is struggling with. And we know that these um, Teens dealing with this have a very high suicide rate. It's something we want them to be able to discuss with an adult, right? We want them to know that they have a place to discuss these things. And yet it can be very scary to think that potentially their parents or caregivers um, could read those records and harm could be caused to the client, right? Um, so there are some other situations we'll discuss today as well. Things like how do you navigate talking about substance use, court cases with clients, and fidelity. All right. Um, so I understand it's not black and white as with anything in mental health or documentation. It's it's not as simple as just document what the client said. Right. Um, there is some nuance. And that's what we're talking about today. Um, first, of, you know, I would say my first tip is to remember the purpose of your notes. Right. So like I said, you know, your your notes 
the point of your notes is not to hide information about treatment, but you can keep things really focused on symptoms, diagnosis, and skills. So if you think kind of from an insurance standpoint, um, insurance wants to see, you know, what is the justification for this diagnosis and what are the skills you're teaching? What's the progress that's happening? You can do that without discussing a lot of the nuance or details that are actually occurring in session. So let's talk about the case of a teen who is, um, you know, really wants to question and is unsure about their gender identity, for example. Um, if you are talking with that teen about it, a lot of those teens have depressive symptoms. And um, you, if you are billing insurance, for example, you have to give them a diagnosis anyways. What is the diagnosis you're giving them? All of your goals and a lot of the topics and a lot of the things you're discussing in your progress note, um, everything on your treatment plan, it's going to be related to that diagnosis. So don't get sidetracked by worrying about the little details. Think about the diagnosis. Okay, what is the diagnosis I'm giving this person? And let me focus things on that. A lot of times that helps you. Um, if you remember that, it helps to keep things a little bit more vague. And, um, and it's really what insurance you know, wants to see anyways. Um, I'm just checking to make sure we don't have any questions in the chat. Okay, not yet. So um, related to that. So think about diagnostic criteria. Sometimes details do matter. So let's say you have a client who has PTSD and you're going to give them a diagnosis of PTSD and that PTSD is due to a sexual trauma. Um, let's say it was due, it, that could be due to a, a history of sexual abuse by a family member, or maybe it's, you know, um, someone who, where the sexual trauma happened when they're older and it was a rape. Um, regardless, that documenting that circumstance is important. And um, number one, it's, it's very relevant to the care that you'll be providing. And it's relevant to actually the diagnosis itself. That does not mean you have to go into great detail. You can say, you know, for example, due to sexual trauma. Sexual trauma can mean a lot of things. Um, the fact that it is sexual trauma versus a history of physical abuse, those are different things. And the content of your sessions is going to be very different um, based on that. So yes, I do recommend that you actually describe the type of abuse someone is discussing if they are discussing abuse. Um, so sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, domestic violence. Um, you know, I think describing that is important uh, if you think from a clinical standpoint. And again, that's something that um, if you are concerned to that level, um, I, I would really question why, you know, because it, it is relevant for the diagnosis. It's relevant for anyone taking over that treatment. It's relevant for any ethics board coming in and determining if you acted ethically, right? So there are all these scenarios where your documentation can be reviewed. Um, and I think a lot of times we get in our mind, we think of like the televised court case where someone's reading progress notes, you know, um, to you as you're sitting at the stand. But there are lots of other scenarios where things can happen. Um, and if something happens to your client and a family member complains and an ethics board is reviewing, an ethics board is going to say you needed to have those details in order to determine if you acted ethically, right? So, um, so when you talk about abuse, I would qualify what kind of abuse. Beyond that, you may or may not need to go into detail. Again, this is not a black and white answer. Um, if you have someone who has severe PTSD and it is specifically around a specific family member because they were sexually abused by that family member for years, and now they have children of their own and their children are about the age they were when they started being abused, and it's causing significant um, distress for them because now they no longer want to go to family events and no one else understands. And these are somewhat common scenarios that we're discussing in therapy, right? And those are a really big deal. And having the fact that it was a family member who caused the sexual abuse is very relevant in that case. You don't necessarily need to go into even who the family member was, but saying that it was sexual abuse by a family member, um, that level of detail is, is extremely relevant for anyone who would ever be reviewing that file for some reason. And you don't need to go into the level of depth of describing the abuse itself or um, 
even describing like how often it occurred that again, that could be relevant may or it may not be. Um, I don't necessarily think it's wrong to describe maybe frequency of the abuse. Um, but I would not recommend going into details about the abuse itself. Um, even though you may have significant time and content of your sessions that is dedicated to discussing um, the actual abuse. So in that scenario, it is okay to just say, you know, client discussed their sexual trauma, client discussed the sexual abuse by their family member. Um, you know, and it doesn't need to go beyond that. Again, the content of that session might have been 45 minutes talking in detail about a memory that they had. The notes really you just want to stick to like, what are the symptoms? How does it relate to the treatment goals? And keep your mind focused on that so that you don't feel um, distracted by worrying about how much detail to add into the note about their story. Um, <clears throat> all right. Uh, so I think that kind of covers, I would say, and phrases to use would be, like I said, you know, physical abuse by a family member, sexual abuse by a family member. Uh, if you're talking about um, something that's more recent, recent sexual trauma, recent sexual assault, uh, those are phrases that you can use that are fairly generic but cover, you know, a wide variety of things, but also are specific enough to, for example, justify a diagnosis of PTSD, you know, along with all the other symptoms um, or other diagnoses, right? Um, you can also, if you're talking about in a progress note, you know, client discussed traumatic experience in which, you know, and, and then describe the experience. So hopefully that gives you some phrases that are generic enough to use, but still provide a good level of detail. Uh, let's talk about substance use. I would say I got a lot of questions about this too. Then we'll go into kind of infidelity and gender and sexual things and court cases. Um, so substance use. So again, if, if this is diagnostic criteria, like you have to identify if it's alcohol abuse versus marijuana abuse versus whatever, right? So, um, so the type of drug, yes, it does matter. Yes, it's relevant. Yes, from a qualitative perspective, we know it's relevant. It is very different if someone is using cannabis twice a week than if they are using cannabis uh, 10 times a day versus if they are using heroin twice a week right? Those are, those are very different things and very relevant and potentially very relevant to the care you're providing. Um, so it is, um, you know, it is not necessary to hide the type of substance abuse that someone is describing. Again, with their consent, with understanding that part of your treatment is that you document things. This is one of the things you document. Um, <clears throat> so, consider, you know, is this to the level of, if it is something that you're monitoring or discussing in therapy ongoing, or something that you know is impacting their level of functioning, it is something that should probably be in the progress note or in the record at some point, right? Whether that is just at the intake record, um, and then maybe they're getting treatment elsewhere, um, or whether they identified it as an issue, but then they say they really don't want to work on it right now, and you end up talking about other things, that's still relevant to have um, in your documentation. But again, focus on like the coping skills, focus on alternatives you're discussing with them. You don't have to go into great detail and let people know. Ask them how they would like things worded. Ask them um, what they think. Give them access to their notes. Let them see it. Um, and with substance use, I think this is also where, um, there was some, some research done through the VA, uh, where it showed that clients weren't necessarily upset about the fact that it was documented, but they would get upset by how it was documented sometimes if they felt that the, um, you know, either like the psychiatrist or the therapist was being judgmental about it. So I think that's really, um, that's a, a really helpful study to remember. And with that, keep it very objective. It's just very black and white. Client reported, um, you know, client reported using alcohol twice last week. Client reported using alcohol and feeling guilty about getting drunk. Um, you know, client reported um, needing uh, cannabis in order to cope with anxiety over the last week. Um, it's okay to write those things in there. And 
to just be very black and white about it and just think of it as um, whatever's observable, whatever was reported to you or was observed and whatever they said. Um, you don't need to qualify it with any um, define any any definitions about like, you know, even maybe how it's impacting them unless they said how it's impacting them. You can just report on the use itself based on what they said. Um, <clears throat> all right, let me check in the chat because we did have a question. How might you document an incident of a spouse being taken away by the police for putting hands on the client? So awesome. We are going to talk about um, that type of thing right now. So, uh, so if it's the client and the, um, I would literally document it that way. I mean, that is like a police report. Think of it as a police report. It is just a fact. Like that is a fact that happened. You are not um, saying who called the police, whose fault it is, um, anything like that, right? And you are going to be um, typically reporting something like that based on the client's, what the client is telling you, right? Knowing that um, as much as we may feel for our clients and they may be in really difficult situations, we're also limited by the information they are giving us, right? So it would just be, you know, client reported their spouse was arrested over the weekend um, for, you know, whatever it would be. Like if I, if they said putting hands on, then I would literally put that in quotes. If they said for hitting, I would literally put it in quotes, but just whatever the client reported to you. Um, let's say, let's flip it and say maybe it was, it's a child client and they're telling you about how, um, you know, one parent was arrested over the weekend for, um, again, you're just reporting, keep it really, really observable quotes. This is when quotes help you, um, literally just write what the client said. And it doesn't need to be in any more detail than that. Um, and typically in scenarios like that, a lot of the session is the client kind of um, like venting and emoting and sharing the story, right? Because they are both um, like expressing feelings around it, but also just kind of like need to get the story out and need to explain it to you. So, um, or on the flip side, they say it and it's very flippant and then they don't want to talk about it at all, right? And so you would just note one of those things, you know, client, dis client discussed um, cause really you're going to keep the focus on the emotions, like client discussed anxiety as related to spouse being arrested over the weekend. Now, if someone's spouse, let's say was arrested over the weekend, that is very different if they were arrested for tax fraud versus if they were arrested for murdering a family member versus if they were arrested for shoplifting versus if they were arrested for actually abusing the client themselves, Right. Those are four extremely different scenarios that are all relevant. So I, if you have that information, I would put that in there. Um, but then you're going to focus on what's the client feeling, right? What were they reporting? What um, were their symptoms? Um, were, did their symptoms increase or decrease as a result of that, right? So even if we use like the shoplifting example, um, which we would likely see as kind of lower level type of arrest, um, you know, maybe it was extremely distressing for the client because they have three kids and all of a sudden they were thrown into, you know, being a single parent for the weekend. And now they're really worried about what's going to happen. And now they have to hire an attorney. And so they're worried about money. You know, that's a very different scenario than someone who, um, whose spouse was arrested for abusing them. And maybe this is ongoing, right? Maybe this is a turning point where the client begins sharing with you about abuse that's been occurring that they haven't felt comfortable sharing yet. Um, maybe it's the first time this has happened. And so that's a different discussion with the client. Um, but that would be extremely relevant. And that's one of those things where potentially in the future, um, that could be like an ethics board looking at, did you do your due diligence and making sure that you discussed safety planning with this client, right? Um, and actually, you know, addressing the issue at hand. All right. So other things with like families and couples, infidelity. So infidelity is another one. I, I would not recommend identifying the other party. Um, avoid that as much as you possibly can. Um, again, sometimes you might have to do that. Sometimes you may not. Um, it could be very different if someone is, you know, in having an affair with their spouse's brother versus their 
coworker. Um, you know, those details may come up at different points. Um, but definitely do not use names for the other party. And if it is relevant, then, you know, for example, let's say someone's having um, an affair with their boss. That's probably relevant because then maybe other things are coming up as far as the stress around the situation also has to do with being worried about losing their job or um, being worried about different things at work. Um, and so that may be a relevant detail. You could potentially say, you know, management at work right? And you don't have to identify that it's their specific boss. Um, but if that is what the person is talking to you about, the client is talking to you about, then that could be relevant. Um, that could also be a client that maybe flippantly talks to you about that. And then it's not really the point. Maybe actually most of their content, most of the content of their sessions relates to their unhappiness with their current spouse or, um, with other, you know, or with parenting struggles or with other things. And in that case, again, you don't need to worry about it. Focus on what is the client's symptoms? What are, is their current concern? What are they talking about? Right. Um, another thing you could also um, use is to discuss maybe the, the concept of them keeping a secret from their spouse. Right. So if you are really uncomfortable with using the term infidelity or affair, um, you know, and it has more to do with the fact that they are keeping a secret and um, concerned about that, then you could say that. Um, and you, another phrase you could use is family conflict. So if there is a lot of like back and forth, um, a lot of arguing, um, family conflict is okay. Again, it's sometimes that phrase is not going to be good enough to actually capture what's happening. Um, and you want to think about this from all levels, a lot of these situations can potentially turn into CYA situations. So it's, it's not only about protecting your client's confidentiality. Again, inform them of the limits to such confidentiality. Um, and one of those limits is potentially that you could be reviewed, right? Um, and so you want your documentation to show and justify the clinical things that you were doing. Let me check the chat again, because I saw we had a couple of questions. How do you document if your client reported alleged sexual abuse, particularly for child clients? How would you want to document keeping in mind documentation may go to court? So um, related to this, so like when children report abuse of any kind, um, you do absolutely want to document in that progress note um, the reason that you had to report it, because if someone is documenting that, it is... Remember, it is not up to us as the mental health professional to determine if the abuse occurred, if someone expresses to us some incidents of abuse. But in the, in the case of children, it is our duty, along with lots of other professionals, to report alleged abuse, right? Um, and so often we have to report, even when we know maybe a child, you know, or a client is making something up, or even when we know something's kind of a gray area or on the cusp, and we don't really think it might be beneficial. That is not our call. Our call is to make the report. So you would want to explain, and that is breaking confidentiality when you make a report, right? So if you're making a report, you do in your progress notes say, um, for example, um, client reported um, their mother slapped them in the face over the weekend and called them whatever name. Um, different states are going to have to. <laughs> I don't know if that's a big deal in Texas. When I was in California, that would have been reportable, right? So, I mean, there's a little bit of wiggle room here. But let's say like sexual abuse, right? Like let's make it just really obvious. Client reported um, their coach, um, you know, touched them on the butt and said whatever. Uh, and, um, you know, so I, you know, made report and then you would usually write down the report number. Um, you don't then have to go into the level of detail that you would in a report. Often in a report, you have to write like, ev like almost a transcript of what was said. Um, so the child abuse report itself is separate from your progress note. Your progress note should have enough information to justify breaking confidentiality, right? So like the fact that the child reported X, Y, and Z. Um, but it doesn't have to go into the entire story. So in the case of sexual abuse, a lot of times children will kind of tell you like a whole story, a whole thing that happened. 
and um, you would just then say something like, you know, client reported um, that their, you know, parent touched them inappropriately, therapist made a child abuse report, right? Um, and then the report has all the details of what they told you. You don't need to relay the entire story in your progress note. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and, and even with that, it's not necessarily about it going to court or whatever. Again, like court, don't worry about it going to court. Um, in a lot of abuse cases, it's much more about, did you do your due diligence? And then it's going to be a lot of follow-up stuff. Um, and it's probably going to be more about documenting discussions like with social workers and things like that. Um, let's see, what do you recommend should be included or touched on in each progress note for chronically suicidal clients? So that will address kind of at the end, it's related, but a little bit different from what we're talking about. Okay. Um, all right. So since we were talking about court cases, let's do that. And then we will do discussing, um, co different concepts with teens. So court cases, um, if clients are in a court case, like I would say like the most common experience I had was clients in workman's comp cases. Um, this is where you do not want, if your client in your therapy session can discuss, you know, anything they want with you, right? It's confidential for the most part, you know, regard, you know, depending on the circumstances, um, but they can discuss their court case with you. Often what they're discussing with you is kind of the stress around it and maybe like feeling confused about different things or being angry at their attorney or being angry at different parties in the case, right? Um, and that's more the content of your session. Um, but make sure that you don't, like if their lawyer advised them to do something, you wouldn't want to document that in your progress note. So you don't want to document anything that relates to like a discussion they had with their attorney. But what you can do is say like client discussed feelings about, up, you know, upcoming court case. Client discussed frustrations with ongoing court case. Client discussed frustrations dealing with attorneys. <laughs> Right. Those are all OK, but you would not say client discussed frustration about attorney's suggestion to do X, Y and Z. Right. Because that is all like their client attorney privilege stuff. Um, and it's OK for the client to tell, you know, to talk to you about those things and give you the details. But don't write those details in your notes. Just talk. Just say court case, you know, frustrations about court case, feelings about court case, whatever it is. Um, and that is is perfectly fine to put in your notes. So that's kind of how you would phrase those things. All right. So lastly, and then we'll get into these other questions. Um, so things with teens. Uh, and I know this has become a bigger concern recently, specifically talking about teens when they have are questioning their sexuality, questioning their gender identity, um, questioning different aspects of their self, but particularly around sexual topics, right? This is kind of... Um, a, a hot thing right now politically, and it is creating concern for a lot of therapists, very understandably. So my recommendation here is, again, remember what I talked about at the beginning, stick with this teen, likely, if you are billing insurance, has a diagnosis of depression or adjustment disorder or um, anxiety, right? And typically, um, and unfortunately, a lot of these teens are significantly depressed. And so it's likely very easy for you to have that as the diagnosis. Um, and then your goals will be related around that, right? So even if this teen, let's say, is severely depressed because they feel um, like they identify as a different gender and are extremely worried about telling family and friends and how they might um, be perceived at school, um, and yet, you know, but they're significantly distressed about this. Um, that often shows up as depression, right? And causes depression. And um, that you would focus on that. And you can say things like depressed mood, insomnia, racing thoughts, um, you know, all of the symptoms that someone with depression has, you don't have to say that it's due to questioning their identity or due to questioning their sexuality. You can just keep it focused on the symptoms. There's no reason to add that other detail. Um, and I would recommend kind of using a lot of these generic general adolescent terms in your progress notes. So it's okay to say that you explored feelings around body image, right? Explored feelings around identity, explored feelings around loneliness, um, explored feelings around feeling out of place. These are all things you could have in your note 
um, they are extremely true and relevant and um, relate to a diagnosis and don't necessarily call out um, sexuality or concerns around gender, right? Um, you could potentially say explored feelings about sexuality. Um, I mean, that would be extremely developmentally appropriate, right? And I would say I would leave that up to you as your call um, about how you feel about using that specific phrase. Um, again, that's, you know, 10 years ago, that would not have been unusual to write that you explored feelings about sexuality with a teen client. Um, most of us in the real world understand that teens are thinking about sex in some way. Um, and sexuality is a very broad term that can encompass many, many things, right? So um, it's very relevant to use. Um, but like I said, you could also just say body image, identity, belonging, loneliness, um, feeling out of place. I would say all, all of those things are very, um, are going to apply to lots of teens in lots of situations, not necessarily raise any red flags or, um, or out anyone about their more specific concerns. And yet it will describe what actually you are discussing in the session um, in, in a very real way. So, uh, so those are the phrases I would recommend using. And you can also say, you know, worried about discussing, you know, um, loneliness with their parents or worried about discussing body image with their mother or whatever. Um, but keeping those kind of more general, like what we would call like common teen concerns, um, using those. Um, let me see if anyone has a specific question about that. And then we'll go to the other topics here. Um, okay. So, yeah, so we had one question about like, why is it important to write about high risk situations instead of omitting them? Um, inherently, anytime something is high risk, then like I mentioned, this is not about them being, uh, your notes being read in a court case. A lot of times this could be about a professional board reading your notes to see if you acted ethically. Um, so if you think about, for example, you know, if someone commits suicide um, or if someone harms someone else, as a result of a lot of the things we've discussed are, um, are very relevant to when those things happen. And those are times when sometimes family members get upset and then complain to a board and then a board is reviewing your work. Um, so uh, those are unfortunate things. Those are not common things that happen, right? But they are potential things. So um, also it's important in high risk situations that, you know, if someone were to take over care or need that client's medical records, like they should know in general what is going on with this person. Um, those are very relevant things. So high risk, we absolutely want to document. Now, related to another question we had before that was, what do you recommend should be included in each progress note for chronically suicidal patients? So that suicidality would be a high risk, not necessarily always a sensitive topic, but definitely a high risk topic, right? And in those scenarios, you typically want to write more rather than less. So I have just given you some phrases to use to make things more generic and, um, and provide less detail, which is not typically what I do, <laughs> right? But I understand it's relevant in certain cases. So for suicidality, um, client quotes, client, client, blah, client quotes all the way, um, you know, because those are very relevant to um, the actions you take. So if a client says, you know, I felt like um, driving my, my car off of the bridge the other day, it is very relevant, the statement that they follow that up with, right? If they follow that up with the statement, but I would never do that to my kids, that is a very protective statement that we know um, indicates most people will not follow through with that action. And instead it's good that they're coming to you and they're using that as a coping to talk to you about these feelings, right? Um, that's very different than if someone says, and the only reason I didn't do it is because I couldn't afford to get gas. That tells me that they're actually a lot more likely to then go and do this, right? And then you're going to have a different conversation with them about, you know, what has kept you from doing that from, you know, Saturday to today, or what has kept you from doing that to now, um, you know, and you're going to start talking to them about what things they can do instead. So those are very relevant things to discuss. Um, <clears throat> now for oftentimes, um, 
it's not that clear with the chronically suicidal client. So a lot of times it might be like, it's, it's a lot of the, the passive thoughts, right? That, that's the phrase we use. So, you know, well, I thought about death or I thought about dying or I thought about how I would kill myself is, is often a common thing people will talk about, right? Um, you know, I thought about what would happen if I killed myself. I thought about how these people might react. I thought about how I could make it easier for these people. So these are often like the ongoing kind of chronic feelings. And I would say you want to continually address that. So as long as it is an ongoing topic in your therapy, as long as it is something that someone, every time you ask them, they continue to say, yes, I did think about um, ways to kill myself in the last week, um, but I'm not going to do it because of X, Y, and Z. Next week, you're going to ask them the same question, right? And if they do that 50 weeks in a row, you're still going to continue asking them. Um, and so the things that are important with suicidality in general are um, using a client quote to document, you know, why they, they plan or do not plan to follow through. That's kind of like the most important part of things. Um, and then uh, documenting your follow-up. So what plan did you create? So obviously if it's someone who's chronically suicidal, you should have some sort of plan in place. Like, will they call you? if they have certain thoughts, um, is there a person that they plan to talk with? Is there a coping skill they use? And then what do they do if that coping skill is not available or that person they talk to is not available, right? So you've already discussed with them what their plan is and you would want to then um, maybe in a particular progress note say that you reviewed with them their plan and they continue, you know, um, and they continue to agree with the plan or that, you um, you know, you reviewed with them um, like additional ways because maybe they tried some coping strategies and it didn't work and that made them feel more hopeless. So you identified new coping strategies. So it may um, be an ongoing thing. If you do have a client who's chronically suicidal, I do think that's something that's worth having like a specific goal around um, and keeping that top of mind until it no longer becomes an issue. And for many um, clients who are severely depressed and suicidal, when they come in, maybe six months later, the suicidality is actually no longer an issue. It's okay to no longer work in that um, until potentially it becomes an issue again, right? Also with this, I would add in history. So if you have a client who has been chronically suicidal and you've been seeing them for five years and they have literally never acted on it and they continue to talk about it and they continue to have skills, um, that's very different from a client that um, you have been seeing for five years and they continue to talk about it and every time you see this like kind of increase, then it ends up turning into a hospitalization or an attempt, right? Those are different things. And that is where you do have to use your clinical judgment as far as how much detail to put into a note, um, because really only you are going to know that. Um, and it should be, but it should be clear for anyone picking up that client's file and reading through it, um, that this was their history, right? Whether their history was continued passive ideation, but no action versus someone who has attempted multiple times. Um, because any of us who have attended any type of training with suicidality know that those are two different clients and with different risk levels, right? <clears throat> so those are the things I would, and, and always think in terms of risk factors, protective factors, right? And you can use those terms in your note if you are worried about the CYA aspect of it. All right. That should probably be its own video talking about suicidal clients because that is a common thing. Um, okay, we discussed a lot. This has been a really long live. Uh, I feel like I've been talking a lot. If we have any other questions, feel free to throw those in here real quick. Um, and if not, we will sign off. I do want to reiterate the points of, you know, keep things focused on the client diagnosis. Yes, add details related to that diagnosis and what justifies it. Um, what I like to always, not like to, but often what I say is like, you you probably don't need the gory details of someone's story, but you do need what happened, right? You do need the fact that they have a history of sexual abuse. You don't need to give us every incident of it and every detail of it. Um, but often who abused them and when that occurred is relevant, right? If we're talking about like an intake history, if we're talking about a, re a revelation a client has given you, they've never brought up abuse. And all of a sudden they talk to you about uh, maybe, you know, their father passes away and that brings up feelings and they never talk to you about the fact that their father abused them. 
um, you know, that is relevant to your treatment. And yes, you would say that they um, discuss that in therapy with you. Again, all you have to say is that, you know, they discuss the fact that their father had abused them um, throughout their childhood. And, you know, they discuss their feelings around that. You don't have to go into all the nitty gritty details of the abuse itself. Um, so those would be my recommendations. Focus on the diagnosis symptoms. Use client quotes when necessary. Um, and then keep all of the gory details out of it. If it's something you feel is important for yourself to remember, that's when you can use a psychotherapy note or process note um, to keep a note to yourself about those details because those are protected at a different level. Your clients don't have rights to them. Um, and so if you feel you need to write the information down, that would be the appropriate place to put that. All right, everyone, thank you so much for your questions and for showing up. And um, I will reiterate a lot of these points in the um, YouTube description below. And we'll be back next week with more hot topics. All right. Bye, everyone. <laughs>